first off I want to thank you for watching these videos I must say the reception I've got has uh, surprised me because it's been surprisingly kind I thought I was going to get a lot rougher ride than I did especially the subjects that I'm covering and the controversial views I'm expressing so thank you for watching I've questioned my motives a lot about what I'm actually doing and why I'm actually making these but apparently it is meaningful for at least some people because I've got a handful of, of subscribers and for me if uh, these videos were meaningful for even one person it would be worth my while making them so please let me know in the comment section below if uh, this format is working for you if you'd like the videos to be longer if you'd like them to be more frequent or less frequent if you'd like them to be more pithy and shorter if uh, the subject range is too broad and in particular if you ask a question I'll try and address that question directly uh, with my wacky philosophy okay now in this episode I thought I'd better address the Christchurch Christchurch uh, massacre uh, it's not something I relish but I thought I'd better because we've been covering the rather taboo area of what it's like after grief uh, it's supposed to be non-existent psychological area but it's an important area that's full and it gives meaning to really our whole existence so if we really are coming to an end of species event as I believe we are then the first stage is to go through the grief of realizing that and then there's years to go perhaps where you have to address the fate of where we are and the psychology and the way to address that has really been forgotten in ancient times so what I'm trying to provide for you is some kind of insight and interpretation some kind of philosophy uh, ways to help you not really cope but to help you have uh, a meaningful existence in the remaining time we've got so then I feel like I have to address things like the Christchurch massacre because it's so obviously one of the things I've been addressing and it's so obviously catharsis obviously it's not the kind of catharsis you would want um, it's against the wrong target but it is catharsis uh, and so let me give my interpretation of what's going on there now the conventional interpretation is it's just hate it's just hate against the Muslim community and I think that's a little too shallow first off if you take that point of view I uh, almost certainly you won't be able to curtail any of these massacres and they should become more frequent and the reason they become more frequent uh, is because if you look at the manifesto of the shooter he says exactly what he's doing and what he's rebelling against is the fact that his identity group his ethnic identity group white Europeans is shrinking according to demographics the birth rate of white Europeans is too low for replacement so the cultural European is going extinct and it's being replaced by presumably by the Muslim community so ethnic replacement now first off let's just examine if if this is even true um, it's often called the myth of of uh, Muslim overpopulation but let's examine if it really is a myth and if there's any merit to what the shooter says so he starts off his manifesto saying it's about the birth rates it's about the birth rates it's about the birth rates saying that the Western European birth rates are too low uh, Muslim birth rates are too high therefore uh, the brown races are going to overtake the white races and the white races are going to go um, it's going to be lights out 
Now, there is some truth to this. The United Nations estimates that without immigration, the United States will reach a population of 326 million by 2100. That would be down from 328 million in 2020. And it would put it about seventh after India, China, Nigeria, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Pakistan, and Indonesia. But with immigration, the United Nations expects that America will reach a population of about 470 million in 2100. So that would be behind India, China, and Nigeria. So that 470 million comes mainly from immigration. So, yeah, the, the idea that Muslims are growing too fast comes from sound population uh, demographics. The average, the world average for population increase is about 1.1% a year. It's about 1.8% a year for, for Muslims. Now, a lot of people say, oh, this is all a myth because the, the, the Muslim birth rate is coming down. Um, but yeah, it's still increasing vastly faster than uh, anybody else's birth rate in terms of ethnicity. Uh, Muslim religion is the fastest growing religion in the world, and it's not growing by converts, it's growing simply by birth rate. So, yes, there is a certain point to, to what the, the shooter is saying. I think it's completely invalid because in my view uh, the Muslim population is going to suffer uh, from the effects of, of uh, really dramatic climate change uh, in the very near future. So there's going to be abrupt climate change. I think that's, that's a given. Uh, nobody can escape that reality. And if you look at the population centers for Muslims. If you just look at, say, this this map of uh, countries that are 100% Muslim by population, I think that Muslims are in for a terrible realization, and that realization is simply this, that either Allah is a myth, or Allah absolutely hates Muslims, and he loves maggots, and he loves flies. Now, why do I say that? Because Allah must hate Muslims, because in terms of water security, if you overlay the map of places that are really in dire trouble from water security over the map of all the Muslim countries, it's hard to conclude anything else other than either Allah doesn't exist or he hates Muslims. Otherwise, he wouldn't have put them in the situation they're about to face. Now, I would pity the Muslim pop population. I don't think there's any threat from a Muslim demographic to the other ethnicities because I think there are going to be disasters in Muslim countries of huge proportions. So the thing that they really, really might shock the world and shock Muslims to and really test their faith is I think it's almost unavoidable that we will get uh, death from heat stroke on mass, on a massive scale. So the reason is from wet and dry bulb uh, thermometer temperatures. So if you have a temperature of about 32 degrees Celsius in 100% humidity, it's lethal for human beings. Basically, they will start dying on mass um, within the hour. There'll be 100% mortality at least within six hours. Now, that area, the Middle East and the Muslim countries, have come close uh, to that. Uh, if it happens, I doubt there'll be any climate deniers left on the planet, because you'll have to contend with, say, CNN and MSNBC and Fox News, all the mainstream media will have these apocalyptic pictures of an event that might run something like this. If you've got these extreme heat uh, events, well, they're not extreme heat events, they're extreme humidity and heat combined. If you have a dry heat, uh, really on the graph, you can survive for much longer with a much more severe temperature. But in terms of a 32, 
32 degrees Celsius um, heat stroke uh, or rather heat wave. Um, if that happened then air conditioning would be critical to survival and it's very easy to imagine a large population center like somewhere like Riyadh um, or somewhere in Bangladesh even um, where people have to be indoors relying on air conditioning to survive for life support you basically air conditioning becomes a life support system in those scenarios what often happens is grids go down because of the demand on the grid would probably exceed what the grid was capable of in those countries it might not come back for hours even days in in that in those scenarios there would be a mass dying and it could be in the millions so there are almost a billion people in these countries that are at risk so yeah it could look truly apocalyptic um, just you know one day in, in summer so I can't see how the Muslim population can face anything other than dire circumstances uh, just because of climate change so I say that Allah must love, you know, hate Muslims and love maggots and flies because if there was such a mass die off, um, maggots can survive a, a temperature of about 40 degrees Celsius to 50 degrees Celsius. So yeah, the flies would be fine. The flies don't need to sweat. And the reason you die in 100% uh, humidity in 30 degrees is because uh, your sweat can't cool you. So flies don't need to sweat, uh, maggots can survive the heat. So yeah, I think what uh, Allah's plan for Muslims must be to feed maggots and flies because I think that's where it's headed. So I think it's far from condemning Muslims for being, you know, the disease of the brain, Islam. I think the, they need sympathy. Um, and I think we'll have to take in a lot of refugees from from these countries. Um, I can't see America getting to 470 million people based on uh, influx of immigrants. I just don't see that's going to happen. I think the, the doors are, are going to slam shut in the face of a catastrophe like that. Um, yeah, it, it, it boggles the mind to think about, but I would uh, guess that the U.S. has making contingency plans. The, the military must be looking at scenarios like this. The CIA, for example, does run these kind of scenarios. And yeah, there, there's a possibility that you would see uh, really uh, Mar American military moving into these areas to secu secure the oil. If there was a mass dying um, on the scale of a million people or more in an oil rich area um, in Iran say, or um, one of the Gulf states, uh, the American military would move in fast and so would probably NATO and maybe Russia as well and probably less likely China. But they must be looking at these scenarios and you have to imagine what it would be like to see on the news that I, I mean American soldiers in these areas uh, in these extreme heat events, they would probably be dressed in something like spacesuits, um, but that would make an incredible, incredible news hour to see people, uh, you know, masses of corpses on the ground and American soldiers in essentially spacesuits walking through uh, the carnage. Um, and yeah, it could, it could happen. It's quite, quite feasible. So I think the last thing anybody needs to do is to go on a shooting spree against Muslims in somewhere like New Zealand. Um, the birth rates are not a problem in, in this scenario. Now, I think that all of these kind of events, um, these kind of massacres and shootings, you can't really prevent them by banning weapons because they you know people would just resort to things like bombs which might kill more people in the end and you can't ban bombs they can be made out of household ingredients but world leaders 
could prevent massacres like this simply by getting on the podium and making a 15 minute speech and what that speech would say is guys it's not your identity group whatever your identity group is it's not white ethnic Europeans that are going extinct it's not Muslims it's it's not the Burmese people that are Buddhists that are being overrun uh, by Muslims there as, as they assume um, we're all going extinct if they came out with the truth and just fessed up that we all going extinct there's nothing we can do about it Greta Thunberg's generation might effectively be the last functional generation of humans so if they came out and said that there really wouldn't be any motivation for having any more of these kind of killing sprees so they're never going to do that because it implies uh, that they are not in control for one thing um, just the fact that they're psychopaths means that they never admit they were wrong and the other thing is they can be pretty sure that as soon as they made that kind of announcement um, yeah the target of killing sprees like that might turn on them so they're far more likely to keep us occupied with things like the war against China or something like that in our final days that's what we'll be rewarded with um, because they're never going to reform themselves as psychopaths say that yep psychopaths have made us go extinct and it's imminent so you might as well get along uh, there's no point in worrying about the demographics of what is going to happen in 2100 because it's very unlikely we're going to get beyond 2030 so that's my opinion on that on the on the geopolitical landscape of, of that kind of a massacre but I'd like to investigate the psychology of it with you because I think our, the interpretations the mainstream interpretations of those kind of disasters like in Christchurch is is quite wrong so the common interpretation is that they motivated by hate I don't really think so. I think to get inside the mind of the shooter in Christchurch uh, and gleaning from what he says in his, his manifesto, I would encourage you to think of it more in terms of a suicide. So it's what I've been saying uh, repeatedly again and again that in terms of the five layered brain model your alien cortex is really combative it's a kind of war machine it's always playing chess it's always strategizing it's always planning for its survival and uh, for the survival of particularly the ego the personal ego now I'm not talking in terms of Freud's um, super ego ego um, and id um, I interpret the id as being the older brain layers and the ego and su super ego is really just two parts of the alien cortex probably not two different parts either so that would be my interpretation of the alien cortex now I've said before that what happens is an alien cortex will fight its corner until it can see no way out when it can see no way out it doesn't seem able to switch off the fight and it turns on itself so it's like I said in the past it's uh, like the myth of a scorpion surrounded by fire stings itself to death and instead of facing the fire and instead of facing the fire of its own consequences an alien cortex will normally turn on itself in a kind of self-loathing and destroy itself and I think that's the way to interpret the Christchurch massacre it's more like a suicide bombing now the the shooter mentioned in his manifesto that he hoped to live but it's a desperate act where he really 
admits that he's likely to die. So you would only do it if realistically your main motivation was to die. So there's more evidence from, say, Indonesia, where what he's doing is he's running a mock. So in Indonesia, it's a very oppressive society, culturally oppressive society. So uh, the individual is very conforming and very meek and mild usually it's uh, is the norm but because the average person is culturally heavily oppressed now every now and again people would break out of that oppression and it was called uh, running a mark still is called running a mark and it would basically be somebody would go on a on a massacring spree normally with something like a a sword or something like that rather than a gun like in Christchurch but in, a, in essence it's the same thing it's uh, running amok now the culture was very forgiving of running amok they would say it would be like having uh, they, they interpreted it as a, a tiger spirit coming out of the jungle and jumping into the person making them go mad and run around chopping people up uh, so the individual wasn't condemned for it. Now, Western psychiatry is increasingly considering running amok as psychopathological uh, and not nearly as forgiving as the Malay community is, for example. Now, running amok was a kind of suicide. So, if you're under social pressure, uh, to the point that you couldn't take it anymore, you exploded. Uh, you basically bottled things up so much, uh, the culture requires you to bottle things up so much that eventually you can't bottle it up anymore. And in a fit of self-destruction, you run around also in spite taking it out on the culture around you indiscriminately. And I think that's the way to look at these, um, these kinds of massacres uh, that happened in, in Christchurch. Now, running a mock, surprisingly, is actually in the DSM. It's actually in the diagnostic sorcery manual that psychiatrists use for their witchcraft. Um, and it is considered uh, pathological. Now, what is going on in this scenario? I would interpret it in terms of the self-loathing um, of the alien cortex. So Freud mentioned that there is a death drive. The alien cortex certainly has a death drive. Uh, he called it Thanatos. Well, actually it was Sabina Spielrein, but of course she's a woman, so whatever she says doesn't really matter, and because what she says doesn't matter, it's quite okay for people like Freud and Jung to steal her stuff and claim it's theirs. So yes, um, Thanatos, uh, the death drive then is attributed to Freud, but it's really Sabina Spielrein. So Thanatos and the death drive is as opposed to Eros, a life-giving drive. Now the way I interpret that in terms of the five brain-led model is that the older part of your brain, the reptilian part, the mammalian part, they're very life-affirming. They, uh, you know, it's all about fight and flight and sex and nurturing and all these uh, really erotic, in terms of eros, um, life-promoting uh, activities. Now, when you get to the alien cortex, then I think you get to Thanatos, and you get to Thanatos because. The alien cortex is playing chess. It's always strategizing. It's planning ahead. Um, everybody's got this little invention or something that's going to make them rich. It's going to get them ahead um, in, ter if, in terms of politics. It's always politicking. Um, there's a lot of uh, one-upmanship. And if the chess play playing that your alien cortex habitually does leads to checkmate, Part of the stages of grief 
are it checking whether it really is in checkmate, just rechecking and rechecking uh, to see if there's any way out. If it absolutely is convinced that there's no way out, it sinks into a depression. And that depression then leads it in a will to control. The, the ultimately, the alien cortex has a will to control. If it cannot control anything, it resorts to controlling the one thing it can control in virtually all circumstances and it controls its own annihilation. So it annihilates itself on its own terms because being an, an annihilated on terms other than its own terms is too much for it to take. That loss of control is uh, incalculable for it. So I think that is the proper way to look at those, those kind of events. Um, in terms of uh, Thanatos, and Thanatos comes about when there's no hope. So what this implies is if we are going into an era where there really is um, an extinction event coming, if we have um, really abrupt, abrupt climate change and um, all these climatic disasters, uh, the four horsemen, if we have shortages of food, we have heat stroke, um, if we have the disease that might come from from uh, these, these associated disasters, climate change induced, uh, in terms of flooding and droughts, uh, pestilence and parasites and uh, war. Uh, war is a good defense for all the psychopaths to just uh, take us into war and to distract us in the end times. Um, and also in a bid, in the same bid, is a futile attempt to keep control. You saw that in Hitler in the, when he was in his bunker all the way to the last, all the way until the Red Army is a couple of streets away. Uh, the effort to keep control lasts until the last thing is to use that last bullet on yourself as the final act of defiant control. So, now, catharsis, that's a kind of maladaptive catharsis. The catharsis that I'm promoting is a catharsis where externally you would purge the system from all these alien cortexes. And an alien cortex uh, really is a psychopath. So, Psychopath is just another name for an extreme alien cortex. The checkboxes on the Robert Hare checklist for psychopathy are really just attributes of the alien cortex. Um, so you can prove it quite easily. I mean, you, you can, if you say, give somebody enough alcohol, the brain shuts down from the top layer going down the stack. And by the time you get to the primate brain layer, you know, people are very buddy-buddy and very social um, because the function of your alien cortex has been dampened down uh, to almost insignificance. So you can see some people getting more amenable, getting, starting to monkey about because they literally turn into primates once the suppressive layer, the controlling layer of the alien cortex disappears. So there is one other thing, uh, no, well, let me just complete that thought. And so in, in catharsis in, in those terms is to get the alien cortex to shut down. So by artificial means, you extinguish your own alien cortex. Uh, so without it getting to commit suicide. So you turn your alien cortex on itself, it cauterizes and obliterates itself, but you stay bodily intact. All the other brain layers are intact. So what it what emerges is somebody effectively uh, without an ego, without an alien cortex. So there are various techniques for doing this, and I'll, I'll share some of these with you, but this goes back uh, through alchemy, it goes back through esoteric uh, religion, it goes uh, back through Zen Buddhism. There are always these undercurrents uh, of esoteric religions that really are secret methods to defeat your own alien cortex and really destroy it for the good of yourself and for the good of everyone else. So you can do that in yourself, but 
Society at large is riddled with psychopaths. Probably one in 20 people is too far gone to be reformed. Uh, so, yeah, society has to collectively deal with that problem and there really is only one way to get rid of the feces of our species, all these leaders, uh, all these people, narcissistic uh, people that have put themselves forward as, as leaders. Um, there's, there's only one way to deal with them. They are incurable. Um, they are, aren't reformable. Um, you, you know, you, now, particularly women feel, well, well, there's, there must be something we can do other than such a drastic means as, I mean, it's so terrible, you know, it's so, so bloody and awful. Um, it's so, it's so opposite to my strong mammalian brain, uh, actually, you know, putting that into practice the night of the long knives and the guillotine uh, it's it seems so so contrary to the mammalian brain that women in particular would prefer something else um, so yeah well I'm open to suggestions but um, throughout history as far as I know nobody's ever found one you can say well oh maybe we could try love the psychopaths you know, good luck with that one Eva Braun um, no, there is nothing you can do. Clinical psychologists will tell you that psychopaths are unreformable. They, you can't medicate them, uh, apart from medicate them functionally out of existence, perhaps with alcohol. Um, but, yeah, there's no permanent cure. And if you try and give them therapy, they'll use that therapy uh, to build more stratagems and be more, more refined as a, as a psychopath. So, yeah. There is only one cure, and that's the guillotine. Now, you can say, well, let's not do it. Well, but I'm saying that almost certainly we'll be driven into things like uh, catastrophes like war. Uh, we'll have to suffer more and more of these events like Christchurch uh, until um, we take matters into our own hands. So really, if we don't do it, there'll be far more blood, pain, and misery. So I recommend that we go ahead and do it. Um, yeah, if we don't, that's that's fine. Just just <clears throat> just remember that um, you you have you share some guilt for what comes next. You're not going to have an infinite amount of time to uh, reverse your decision on being uh, so pacifistic you won't pick up a weapon to you know kill Hitler effectively. So. Yeah, you are. You must take some of the guilt for what comes next, and I think that what comes next is uh, things like, you know, wars, um, um, genocides, holocausts, uh, mass shootings, very ugly stuff. And it could be completely otherwise. So if you look in the Midwest, in the Midwest, all the floods that they've been having. Um, Oh, by the way, <clears throat> I don't think the floods that they've been having are going to severely affect the food price. If you look at things like the futures market, they're not reflecting the fact that there is a food crisis coming. So I just wanted to insert that, is that, that these floods sound really bad, but in terms of food production in the U.S., they're not a crisis. Uh, we'll have to see what happens on planting season in May, but as things stand now, just at the end of March, now uh, there's there's no mass food crisis looming as far as I can see. Okay, so just just wanted to to say that. But when once you get beyond the disaster porn headlines of those floods, you can see this story after story of about how people are coming together to help each other, how the community comes together. Now I don't think that happens while there's government, while there are agencies managing the situation, while the alien cortex is control is in control. You don't get that kind of community spirit and people giving showers to people and giving meals to people and giving them a bed and uh, helping them out fixing stuff. And I don't think that kind of stuff happens uh, normally when psychopaths are in control. So there's more evidence for it you can see in places like Sarajevo. Uh, this, in Sarajevo, I think maybe about 10,000 people died of starvation, but the survivors 
remembered very fondly how people worked together. They had victory gardens on their balconies, they planted seeds, they shared seeds, they shared food in the midst of shelling and dying and very apocalyptic circumstances. They pulled together in a way that's very contrary to what preppers assume in America. So if you're a prepper, you really have a very juvenile um, kind of sophomoric idea of you know, a Mad Max movie that unfolds when you, the shit hits the fan in America. That's not really what happens. If you look at and talk to people that have been in disasters, you'll, you'll see that it's far more like in the Midwest. They help each other out. As long as you get the government, the agencies, NGOs out of the way, uh, all these emergency and relief charities and stuff, they need to be swept aside um, for, for us to, to get to really uh, strong community spirit. And I think that's the only way we can have a decent exit is by helping each other and uh, sweeping aside these psychopaths and their governments and the church. So, yeah, um, Sarajevo is an example of that and then of course my favorite, uh, Catalonia 1936. Um, you, you can only get to that um, once you've done the dirty and had the catharsis on with the psychopaths, the, the great sacrifice of that. So that's, I guess, all I wanted to say on the in terms of the Christchurch massacre. And in the next video, I think we'll go on to uh, some of the techniques I can give you uh, and some of the philosophy of the end times, a way to look at the end times uh, that gives them meaning and gives human existence meaning. So I look forward to to doing those videos and I hope you do too so thanks for watching once again